Hello folks, I hope you're having a great day. Please make sure you are filling in your notes organizer as you watch this video. The topic for this video and our new unit is biochemistry. And that word part bio, you should know by now, that means life or a living organism. So biochemistry is simply the chemistry of life. So what exactly is chemistry then? Chemistry is the study of the composition, structure, and properties of matter. And matter, I'm sure you've heard this definition before, is anything that takes up space and has mass. So basically everything in the world that isn't energy is matter. So in this class, in this unit, we are gonna be focusing on this question right here. How does chemistry relate to biology? We're gonna be looking at life and living organisms down at the very smallest, most atomic level. So we know that cells are the building blocks of life. Don't get confused because atoms are the building blocks of matter. Even smaller than cells, atoms are the basic unit of everything on this earth that takes up space and has mass. And then in the neutron of an atom, or sorry, the nucleus of an atom, we have neutrons and protons. Protons are these positively charged particles, and neutrons are these particles that have no charge. So those two things together make up the nucleus of an atom. Outside the nucleus of the atom, we have particles called electrons. Electrons are negatively charged particles that are located outside the nucleus. So protons and neutrons inside the nucleus, electrons outside the nucleus. Now, and you've heard this, this word before probably because you've studied the periodic table of elements. An element is a pure substance that cannot be broken down. There are over 100 known elements. Each element has a unique name and symbol, which we, of course we can see on the periodic table. So each element has a specific atom, a specific type of atom that has a certain number of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And we can see that kind of information all on the periodic table. So the periodic table is organized by the number of protons and therefore also organized by properties, which are called uh, groups, and those are the vertical columns. So vertical columns are called groups, horizontal rows are called periods. So by organizing the periodic table by protons, um, because certain protons lead to certain properties, you're also organizing the periodic table by properties, which is why you have, you know, like solids in sort of one general area, and liquids sort of in another area, and you have a pattern to your like metalloids and nonmetals, that sort of thing. Okay, so if we were looking at the grid of a certain element on the periodic table, we can determine certain information. So the first thing you can see on the periodic table for any element is the atomic number, which would be this 47 right here. The atomic number gives us the number of protons in the nucleus of an element, or in the nucleus of an atom. And a neutral atom, remember protons are positive, so in a neutral atom, an atom that has a charge of zero, uh, that it's also telling us the number of electrons. Now, in chemistry, if you take that class, you know, they're going to get into non-neutral atoms and isotopes and all that stuff. But in this class, we're going to be focusing on neutral atoms. So in our case, for every atom, every element, the number of protons and the number of electrons is going to be the same. So the atomic number gives us the number of protons. And in a neutral atom, therefore, also the number of electrons. So silver here, AG, that's its symbol, has an atomic number of 47. So it has 47 protons. The atomic mass, which are these numbers down here in the periodic table, is gives us the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So basically, all the parts that make up the nucleus of an atom. So in the case of boron, we have 11 protons plus neutrons. That's our atomic mass. But we also know that boron only has five protons. So therefore, how many neutrons does boron have? What can we figure out from these numbers right here? Well, 5 plus 6, that would be our missing number, equals 11. So we know that boron must have 6 neutrons. So there's our formula here for finding the neutrons. We take the atomic mass, and we subtract from it the atomic number, and we're left with the number of neutrons. So let's do carbon here. Carbon's an easy one. So we have 6 as our atomic number, so we know we have 6 protons. And we have 12 as our atomic mass. So we have 6 protons plus x number of neutrons equals 12. So what would that be? Yeah, six. Six protons, six neutrons for a mass of 12. You think you can figure out nitrogen? Very good, seven neutrons. 
Okay, so we can't talk about atoms and chemistry without talking about the bonds that hold atoms, molecules, and compounds together. So those are chemical bonds, and there are two types of chemical bonds. If you've ever seen 21 Jump Street, which you should not because it's rated R, um, there's a part where Channing Tatum feels really stupid because he doesn't know the difference between covalent bonds and ionic bonds. He's taking AP chemistry. Um, but here's, here are the two types of bonds. Covalent bonds are when you have electrons that are shared between atoms. In ionic bonds, you have like really oppositely charged atoms, um, so a positively charged atom and a negatively charged atom, and they're bonded together, so the uh, electrons end up being given to the stronger atom. So in covalent bonds, the keyword here is shared, electrons are shared. In an ionic bonds, the electrons are given to the stronger atom. So again, this is on your notes organizer. You should be filling in. We are around numbers 11 and 12. Okay, so you're going to get confused here in a second, but we're going to practice this, so don't worry. A molecule is formed when two or more atoms join together chemically. Those atoms can be two of the same atoms. Those atoms could be two different atoms. It doesn't matter as long as it's two or more atoms joined with chemical bonds. A compound is a molecule that contains at least two different elements. So we've got two atoms that are joined together, but in this case, they're going to be two different atoms. Okay, so this could be two different atoms, this could be two of the same atoms, that's a molecule, but a compound is going to be two different atoms bonded together. So here's a statement, all compounds are molecules, but not all molecules are compounds. Okay, so fill in your Venn diagram there, and then flip to the back under number 14. So let's go through a couple here. We've got O2, which is atmospheric oxygen. Atmospheric oxygen, oxygen in the atmosphere is always two oxygen atoms bonded together. So we have two atoms that are the same. Would that be a molecule or a compound? That would be a molecule, right? Now let's look at H2O, which hopefully you know is water. We've got two hydrogen atoms bonded to one oxygen atom for a total of three atoms bonded together. So would that be a molecule? Absolutely, because we've got more than two atoms, right? Would it be a compound? Yes, because we have two different elements bonded together. So H2O is both a molecule and a compound. Okay, here's sodium chloride. We've got a sodium atom bonded to a chlorine atom. This is salt, by the way. Is this a molecule? Yep, because we've got two atoms bonded together. Would it also be a compound? Yes, because they're two different elements. Okay, now see if you can figure out atmospheric nitrogen. N2, two nitrogen atoms bonded together. That would be just a molecule, right? It fits the definition. We've got two atoms joined together, but they're not different, so it wouldn't be a compound. Okay, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about chemical reactions in this class, um, but you need to know the difference between a physical reaction and a chemical reaction. A physical reaction is simply when you have a change in the state of matter of something. You're not actually changing it into a new substance, you're just changing its state. So crushing a can or melting an ice cube, you're not changing the chemical makeup of those items, you're changing the physical makeup of those items. So a frozen ice cube melting into liquid water, it's still H2O, the chemical is still the same, right? The molecule, the compound, um, but, but you're just changing the state that it's, that it's in. And then a chemical reaction is when you have atoms or groups of atoms that are reorganizing themselves into different chemical substances. So rusting or combustion, anytime you have oxidation, which is like rusting or combustion, which is burning, um, that's always going to be a chemical reaction. Cooking is typically a chemical reaction. You have a change in the chemical makeup. So in chemical, re when you have chemical reactions, you write them in a certain way. Um, that is called a chemical equation. So a chemical equation describes the substances in the reaction and arrows indicate the process of change. So on the left side of a chemical equation, you have the things going into the reaction, okay, the things that are reacting. So we call them reactants on the left side of our arrow. And you usually call the arrow the yield sign. And then on the right side of our equation, it's what's being produced in the chemical reaction. So that's why we call them products. So the substances that are being formed, produced, products. Reactants are reacting, products are being produced. Okay, so here's our reaction. 
carbon dioxide and water react together to form glucose and oxygen. Any idea what biochemical process this equation represents? Can you think of anything that has glucose and oxygen being made? <coughs> hint, hint, it's photosynthesis. Okay, so we have 6CO2 plus 6H2O yields C6H12O6 plus 6O2. So carbon dioxide and water over here on the left side would be our reactants, the things coming in and reacting. And then glucose and oxygen would be our products, the things being produced. So now we take our chemical reactions and our chemical equations and we can illustrate them in an energy diagram to show how energy is either being absorbed or lost in the reaction. So in an energy diagram, uh, or in a reaction, you either have the reaction taking in energy or releasing energy. Energy diagrams are simply a way to illustrate the energy that is being used or produced in a reaction. So here's an example of an energy diagram. And I believe you're going to have to draw a couple of these on your notes page. Okay, so in an energy diagram, let's talk about the parts here. You have what's called the activation energy. Every reaction takes a little bit of energy just to start, to activate. That's called the activation energy, the energy needed for reactants to form products into, in a chemical reaction. So in an exothermic reaction, you're going to have a total release of heat energy. So it's an exothermic reaction inside of a test tube would actually feel hot because you're going to have a release of energy. In an endothermic reaction, you have energy coming into the reaction. It's absorbing heat energy. So in an exothermic, you have heat energy leaving or exiting. In an endothermic reaction, you have heat energy coming into the reaction. So okay, we have our reactants over here, and that's their energy level. You can see on the graph. We have our products over here, and that's their energy level. So total, we had we started with a high amount of energy, and now we have a low amount of energy. So overall, we had a loss of energy because energy was released. Does that make sense? So what type of reaction would this diagram be here? An endothermic or exothermic? We had a release of energy, therefore a loss of energy in our products, so this would be an exothermic reaction. So that's number 19, draw and explain that. Okay, here's an exothermic reaction. The energy of the product is lower than the energy of the reactants, that's number 19. Okay, here we have an endothermic reaction. So here's the energy level of our reactants, what's coming in. Here's the energy level of our products, what's being produced. You can see that it's a lot higher, which means energy must have been absorbed into the reaction. So that would be endothermic. And in a test tube, this would actually feel cold. Okay, so that was number 20. Make sure you draw that. Now we have in reactions, this is where biochemistry comes in. We have these special proteins called enzymes that are catalysts, meaning they help to speed up chemical reactions by lessening the activation energy and speeding up the rate of the reaction. Okay, let me say that again. Enzymes do two things. They decrease the activation energy and they increase the speed of the reaction. It does not increase how much product is being made and it doesn't even get used up in the reaction. It only does those two things. It lowers the activation energy so it takes less energy and it happens faster. That's why we as living things love enzymes because now we can do all these reactions and we don't have to use as much energy and we don't have to use as much time because it takes less time. So enzymes are very helpful to living things. So enzymes work with this lock and key model. Okay, they follow this sort of lock and key model. Just like one lock has one specific key that fits it, one enzyme fits one specific substrate. So the substance that is being acted upon by the enzyme is called the substrate. The location where the substrate binds to the enzyme is called the active site. Okay, so here's our substrate, the, the thing that's being acted upon. Here's our enzyme. Here's where they bond together, where they fit together like a lock and a key fit together. And then there is our final product. Okay, so you can see it took a little piece from this one and put it over there. And the enzyme made that happen faster and it made it happen with less energy. And we're going to see in class how this is so beneficial to living things. Okay, so um, I think I'm going to stop here on this slide. Write these down under number 24. These are some uh, reactions that use enzymes to catalyze or to speed up reactions in living organisms. And then on the blog, I'm posting a link. I want you to click on that link and do some practice work with enzymes. 
I hope you're having a great day. See you in class.